decided to try and rewrite what I thought I would come with. We had lunch, and that reassured me a bit. And then Jeff's talk reassured me still further that each of us arrives with our own kind of thing to say about home. And I was not going to be very apologetic and try and stitch what I want to say into what the other speakers have said. I'm going to leave you to make the connections. So that's the burden you have. What I want to do is to talk about a rather different way of thinking about home. I want to see if I can focus the discussion of home on the way in which people were talking about issues of domesticity and the way in which government might think about assisting the family, securing the quality of family through the social housing program that was to be built immediately the war finished in Britain. In 1943, I suppose people thought it would start in 1944. But anyhow, the social housing program that was to start immediately after the war as part of this process of reconstruction. And what I want to do is to see if I can focus this discussion on a particular text. It's called uh, Design of Dwellings. It's a curiously anodyne text. It's written by, I mean, the pencil that writes the text has a lot of hands on it. The collective pencil is driven by a lot of people. So I suppose there isn't a great deal one can say in detail about the authorial quality of it. But I want to see if I can say something about that text and make sense of that text by putting it back in historical context and in those terms say something about the instability of the way in which people were thinking about the home at this time. Let's see if these wands work. No. Yes. Right. Well, I thought I'd do, as if I focus the discussion, by starting off by showing you two or three slides of a block of buildings built by the Tecton Partnership, designed in 1943 and largely complete by 1950. They are, I suppose, one of the happier images of the way in which modern architecture comes set in the service of society. thinking about the exterior forms of the buildings, thinking about the facades, thinking about the architectural intention, thinking about the relationship between the designs and social program. There are a variety of ways we have of thinking about that. If you go inside these blocks of flats, there are blocks of flats which have in some cases the original inhabitants in. If you go inside the block of flats, it's one, one of the curious things to try and do is to work out the way in which the designers, and indeed society, judged the way in which the architects were framing the design for home. If you listen to Mr. Lebetkin, or at least John Allen's rendering of Mr. Lebetkin, we're told that what Lebetkin wished to do was to offer to the working class family, every man, the same kind of facilities, the same kind of benefits that he'd offered to the middle classes at high points one and two. And there are a series of ingenious devices, places for storing crockery and so on, in the serving hatch between the kitchen and the, the dining room, all of which are meant to be labour-saving devices. I suppose they don't quite rank with the luxury of Philip Johnson, Dr. Edith uh, Farnsworth. But in any event, there's an attempt to offer the kind of benefits which might be made available to the more affluent, to the working classes. But how should we read these as rendering of images of home? I suppose there are a whole variety of ways in which we could represent the kinds of images that you might bring to home. 
Is it a question of offering to families like this the promise of the welfare state? Is it to do with the designers conceiving of a well-ordered home being run by ladies like this? To try and get some understanding of what people thought they were being offered and the context in which they were offered, I want to look at this issue of home. It seems to be a natural starting point for a discussion of what people thought about home is the question of the war itself. I suppose the First World War, certainly the Second World War, is focuses discussion on the war, on the, on the home. The war is a condenser of social change. But also the terms in which war encourages people to think about change is, I think, difficult. G.D.H. Cole suggests, I think, some of this instability of the way in which people think about the home, or think about reconstruction, and the promise of what reconstruction will bring seems to be particularly important in thinking about the home. Writing in 1943, in a book called Plan for Britain, he writes, even if people have in them the spark of idealism, and are ready to play their part in making the world a better place than it used to be, it is still apt to keep their private and in public enthusiasms in separate compartments. So as to speak one minute about the world they hope to see, and the next about how nice it will be to get back to their old jobs and their old homes, or to something like them. Or at least as far as can be managed. And I suppose that sense of the promise of reconstruction holding out both the recovery of the familiar, the warm, the colorful, the remembered setting of birthday parties, 21sts, divorces, whatever. I mean, the, the sense in which the home held out that quality of memory on the one hand, and the whole language of the program of reconstruction held out a vision of what would be, of something much better, of the kind of things that our American sisters enjoying in America at the time that we in Britain are suffering. That sense of a debate about the home needing to accommodate both the remembered and the hoped for means I think the discussion of the home is problematic. The starting point for the discussion of the home is I suppose the trials to which the family and households are subjected, subject to as a result of the assault from the air begins in 1940. The Blitz tends to be relatively non-destructive, but the effect of the Blitz and the official precautions that people take in order to prepare people for the Blitz, I think throw out a whole series of difficulties for the family and reveal to a larger section of the population that would otherwise have known about it some of the characteristics of family that seemed largely buried, hidden, buried from the eye of the middle classes. I mean, if we think of the, the consequences of destruction, the level of destruction that we see here in the first period of, in, in the Blitz is relatively light. But the disruption of family life is intense. The consequences of evacuation are enormous. The in, um, by September 1941, 60,000 children have been removed from London, and they're accompanied by what? Nearly 130,000 children and mothers. And they're taken from their homes, they're sent elsewhere, they're billeted with other people. They're not only disoriented, but the people who receive them are equivalently disoriented. The level of destruction that takes place is, in the Blitz, is considerable within um, well, within barely uh, three weeks of the beginning of the Blitz, the LCC was having to accommodate 
something like 25,000 people in the emergency shelters that it had set up. The basis on which the shelters had been set up was essentially that of the old poor law, the difficulty in procuring blankets, and suddenly the LCC found itself faced with the problem of providing for large numbers of people, actually clothing, housing them, feeding them, if necessary, providing them with money. The Blitz is simply one incident in the process of destruction. Much more acute is the destruction wrought by the fly-bomb campaign that begins in the summer of 1944. People had hoped that Britain would be able to recover after the end of the Blitz, the effective end of the Blitz in 1941, at the end of the night bombing campaigns, the end of 1942. But in 1944, in the middle of the summer, begins a new campaign, and the consequences of this campaign are quite shattering. Something like 20,000 houses are being damaged a day from the middle of July right through to the end of September. And the rocket bomb, the V2s, carry on this process of destruction right through to 1945. Now, the consequences of that level of destruction for family life are easy to imagine. And one can render them in the imagery of the time. Picture Post does, provides a whole range of images, which I suppose can enable us to understand the stresses and strains to which the family is subject. This is in 1940, sorry, Picture Post issues from 1940. And you can see this young lady is run out of her house, thrown on a coat, grabs some possessions, put them in a suitcase, and come with her slippers on with her young son. She is at least in this case, time bombed. That's to say, there's a time bomb that's fallen on the area, so she can't return home. And the sequence of photographs follows the process of trying to adapt to being rehoused outside the home. People need to be clothed, they need to be fed. The LCC is having to invent a whole series of solutions for these different kinds of tasks child has to be bathed, he's then put to bed in these kind of conditions. And for so many families, the day-to-day -day experience of the Blitz, what, September to uh, 1940 through to the spring of 1941, has elements of this, or at least the, possible, the threat of it, and the consequences of the possibility of being rendered homeless and having to take refuge in some of the long-term shelters. For those people whose houses are merely damaged, and there's a whole set of categories about the level of physical damage to the home, for those people whose houses are simply damaged, the task of trying to survive in bomb-damaged houses, or referred to as C2s, is considerable. War-damaged houses might mean having no window glass, having no ceilings, having all the slates, tiles blown off your roof. And as the sequence of photographs, again from picture post, suggests, the difficulties of trying to survive in those conditions are acute. So the family is under threat from physical assault in those terms. It's also under threat for a variety of other reasons. The disruption to family life is extreme. You think of the traditional image of the family, the image that people think of when they look back to the pre-war years, the warm years with sunlight and so on. People see a husband, a wife, two children. But if you think what's happening to the family during the war, of course, it's as if those, a number of those characters were simply rubbed off the photograph. The husband, like as not, goes to the services. He may be sent abroad. In any event, he's unlikely to be available in home except on the relatively infrequent period of home leave. One of the most important disruptions to the family during the war is the absence of women. Britain, as you probably remember, conscripts a higher proportion of women into the war effort than any of the other combatant nations. And the level of involvement of women is very considerable. If you were over 18 and under 56, you were liable for war work unless you had children under the age of 14. 
and people between 18 and 56, 81% were engaged in war work. And even of those people who had children under the age of 14, 19% are engaged in war work. So that in many house households, the mother might be absent for considerable periods at the time, particularly if she's working shift work, it means two of those key figures from those pre-war photographs are missing. In many respects, in, in many cases, the task of running the family devolves on the eldest daughter, and there are a series of descriptions in Angus Calder's books and elsewhere which describe the difficulties that these children face in trying to keep that image of home life alive. So the home is, up, is under threat because of the, the need to gird it, the need for the country to gird itself up to prosecute the war. Then in addition, the people's perception of the family is also threatened, and people are astonished at what they find out about the family. For those people shaping policy, thinking about the nature of the family, they're astonished to find what the process of evacuation means. Evacuation provides disruption. Sunders further the kind of links that would have held that pre-war family together. But it also persuades people to think about the nature of the families who are being evacuated. Middle-class families describe with astonishment the problems of bedwetting, of lice, that the guest families bring when they arrive with their rural hosts. The, there are a series of reports written by organizations, the National Federation, the National Federation of Women's Councils, which document what people regard as this revealed pathology of the family. To summarize, a report written in 1943 characterizes the difficulties that are experienced by host families in the following terms. The state of the children was such that the school had to be fumigated after their reception. Except for a small number, the children were filthy, and in this district we have never seen so many verminous children lacking any knowledge of clean and hygienic habits. Furthermore, it appeared they were unbathed for months. One child was suffering from scabies, and the majority had it in their hair, and others had dirty septic sores all over their bodies. Their clothing was in a deplorable condition, some of the children being literally sewn into their ragged little garments. Conditions of their boots and shoes, there was hardly a child with a whole pair, and most of the children were walking on the ground. No souls, just the uppers hanging together. Many of the mothers and children were bedwetters and were not in the habit of doing anything else. Indeed, the appalling apathy of the mothers was painful to see. And Oliver Litt Littleton, who was a member of the cabinet and who took in a number of children to demonstrate his solidarity with the rest of the population, describes his shock in the following terms. I got a shock. I had little dreamt that English children could be so completely ignorant of the simplest rules of hygiene and that they would regard the floors and carpets as suitable places on which to relieve themselves. And an attractive comment from a Scottish lady, embarrassed about the behavior of her child, reproves her child, you dirty little thing, messing up the lady's carpet. Go and do it in the corner instead. Well, what this revealed, I suppose, about the nature of the English family caused extreme anxiety and prompted people to consider the problems of the family and of the home as one of the major issues of reconstruction. It becomes one of the major issues at the parliamentary election of 1945. After employment, it's the single most important thing that people talk about. And in terms of the language of building a new Britain, this ideal of building a new home, of creating somewhere, which was going to provide for the family, is an important part of this kind of contract that exists between government and the people. Writing after the war, <coughs> writing the history of the welfare services during the war, Titmus it seems to me, captures some of this sense of an undertaking, a pledge given by government 
to improve conditions. He writes, there existed, so to speak, an implied contract between government and people. The people refused none of the sacrifices that the government demanded from them for the winning of the war, and in return, they expected that government should show imagination and seriousness in preparing for the restoration and improvement of the nation's well-being when the war had been won. Government engages in a variety of undertakings to, to transform conditions when the war will have been won. It engages in a determination to embark on physical planning. The Town and Country Planning Act 1947 is not its consequence of that determination to embark on physical planning, something which is evidently necessary given the destruction of the war. The construction of housing, the workings of the Burt Committee, the determination to press into service a whole variety of new te technologies in order to either overcome the bottlenecks that had held back the construction of homes for heroes after the First World War, is another way in which the government <coughs> proposes to redeem its pledge. And of course, I mean, the larger field of social policy, the beverage report, the discussion of the medical service, the plans for extending the school leaving age, to write papers on education. Government is engaged in a whole variety of ways in which it sets out to build this image of the future. And not least amongst this is an attempt to set out what the post-war home was to be like. And the terms in which it does it is this rather anodyne document that I've got here, this document called the Design of Dwellings. The Design of Dwellings is, to the Second World War, what a much more substantial undertaking, the Tudor Walters Report, was the First World War. In the Tudor Walters Report, I suppose we can see the setting out as a blueprint for home construction after the First World War, what the housing reform movement had been talking about, that curious combination of earnest enthusiasms, and utopian crankiness, that passes for the housing reform movement. In the Tudor Walters report, we could see set out a blueprint for housing after the First World War. Written by Raymond Unwin, it sets out very coherently what he, Raymond Unwin, and his supporters amongst the Garden City lobby viewed as being the appropriate form of housing. There is a certain amount of consultation, but essentially the form of housing that's being <coughs> offered is garden city housing with some gesture towards the trade union members of the group giving information in the sense that a parlour, a best group, is to be included as well. Now the design for dwellings report the report to the Dudley Committee, is, I think, much less, at least ostensibly, much less impressive. It's much less clear-cut, much more anodyne document than the Tudor Walters report. Nevertheless, it does provide, it sets up, provide the official response to this determination to overcome the difficulties faced by the family. And part of the difficulty that I have with this report is trying to understand how that quality, I mean, the extraordinary range of debate going on within government and certainly in the larger circles around government, how that debate is in some way seen to be represented by this report. Because in terms of its contemporary reception, people argue that it addresses many of the issues that people wish to see addressed. The critical position of the report is not in doubt. The report produced in 1944 sets out at the end of it a number of recommendations which are related directly to a document which has the status almost of the uh, statutory instrument issued by the Ministry of Health, a publication called the Housing Manual, which sets out very clearly the terms in which the local authorities were to build the housing with the subsidies that government would give them in order to complete the housing program. 
So the status of this document, actually as an instrument in achieving what so many people wanted, is not in doubt. But if one reads through it, it's very, it's very pallid in its language. Much of it is simply the, the writing of civil servants. The secretary to the committee is a lady, or lady called Judith Ledifer. The committee brings together members of the women's movement, uh, architects, planners. It brings together the range of different kinds of voices that you might expect to hear involved in a discussion of housing. And this document takes as its task making a series of recommendations as to the design, planning, layout, standards of construction, and equipment of dwellings for the people throughout the country. That's its task. And because it was envisaged that, for the greater part, the housing be built after the war was to be built by the local authorities, the fact that this is essentially a document addressed to the local authorities rather than to private enterprise doesn't mean that it's addressed simply to working class needs, though I suppose most people recognized that it was the working classes who'd suffered most and who would have fewest resources to help themselves when the, work, when the war ended. So in that sense, it is a document which is, de facto, addressed to the problems of working class housing. Given the kinds of exhibitions in which people were being encouraged to think about what they might have as a home after the war, given the, the document, I mean, given the variety of articles in women's magazines talking about the way in which the home after the war would retrieve what government had failed to do before, given the heroic quality of that language, the most heroic paragraph in this report comes as something as a shock, at least to me. The, if you think of Churchill's language, if you think of the kind of language in which people are promising what will be after the war, it's wonderful. I mean, it, it's moving. People play on the emotions. But in this report, we get a statement. Um, At the same time, there have been changes of outlook and habit affecting the design and equipment of the houses themselves. The last quarter of a century has seen a steady rise in the general standard of living and a growing desire for an appreciation of good housing, in particular, a convenient domestic arrangements and labor-saving fittings. I mean, a series of truisms, self-evident. We expect this tendency to continue after the war. The government's post-war post -war proposals envisage a wide extension of education and a fuller measure of social security, a series of stubby gestures in the direction of beverage and the other kind of debates going on in government. Housing will be expected to keep abreast of progress in these fields. Housing, in other words, is not going to be left behind. Moreover, the experience gained by the vast number of women now in industry and in the services will influence their attitudes to housing. From wartime factories and hostels often provide high standards of services and equipment, which will make such women intolerant of inferior conditions in their own homes. In the same way, both men and women have become conscious during the war of the potentialities of modern scientific developments and will expect to enjoy the benefits of these discoveries at home. Well, that's about the most moving paragraph in which the report sets out its program as to the way in which the pledge to the people to make conditions better after the war is to be delivered. Most of the other paragraphs are full of obvious points. They talk about the way in which um, all rooms should be of a simple and convenient shape. There's very little concrete thinking about the way in which people live and the, the way in which the family home would actually have to be used. The only real discussion of it comes in a discussion of the routine of the family day and is related to two sets of proposals for ways in which you could organize the key arrangements of the family. One proposal, alternative one, envisages a kitchen in which you might eat and cook with the utility room for a variety of different facilities. The second proposal envisages a working kitchen with your dining room in a living room access. There isn't a great deal of difference. Sorry, there isn't a great deal of, of emphasis 
in the text on what are very fundamental, fundamentally different living patterns. And as one goes through the document, I suppose trying to make sense of it, one concludes that it's not a document that could be made sense of in its own terms alone. Fortunately, however, there's a great deal of material, the workings of the committee are assembled in the public record office, and if you choose to, you can go back to the public record office and you can take apart and examine the range of different kind of evidence that the committee drew up. And what's clear is that the committee actually had an enormous amount of information, had it was able to call, and indeed was punctilious in the discharge of its duty, called most of the people who've written or talked about housing in the interwar years. And reading through the evidence, one is struck by a much more vital set of images of, that accompanied the committee's discussions, which are in some sense purged from the document. And I suppose if one had to characterize the qualities of the evidence, one could characterize it really, I suppose, in two ways. One is to do with documenting that remembered quality of pre-war housing. Documenting what had been, and I suppose to most of the middle class members of the committee, what had been comes as a shock. The kind of information that people were able to draw upon were the kind of surveys of housing conditions in London, for example, the large survey of overcrowding undertaken in the mid-30s, they were able to call upon the kind of statistics, the kind of evidence that had been assembled as part of the great slum clearance campaign, which had been launched in 1930, gets underway in 1933, and is amputated in 1938 with the Munich crisis. They have that information to hand. They also had the information from the medical officers of health, the reminders of the extraordinary brutality of everyday life for so many people in the urban centres, in, in large <coughs> urban centres. These figures taken from Manchester in some respects typical of the kind of working class experience. Infant mortality being virtually double that in the central wards of that in the outer wards. That the life expectancy of that particular child would be subject to just those kind of grim statistics. They consulted people like Elizabeth Denby. They discovered people like, uh, dis they um, consulted people like Marjorie Spring Rice, the, one of the organizers of the medical survey, or the survey carried out by a number of women doctors of patients attending, of women and their children attending postnatal clinics published as a Penguin special, it provided a shocking revelation of the quality of the day-to-day -day existence of working class wives. It produced something of a, a storm of middle class opinion. Perhaps I could just read out a section of one of the reports on housing. Perhaps what's so shocking about it is that the housing conditions, bad though they are, are almost less oppressive than the extraordinary difficulties with health that most of these working class wives have to, ex have to undergo. I expect some people think living in two rooms, one doesn't have to clean much, one didn't have to do much work. I would rather clean a house down than clean my two rooms every day. I have a bed in the back for the two girls, a bed for the boy which I take down every day and put up at night to make more room. Sorry, it's punctuated in the way in which it was taken down. We have our room in this we have our bed in this room, and I do all my cooking here. In the other room is my bed, a bed I make up for the little boy on the settee and the pram and the baby sleeps in. I pay seven and six for these two rooms. I have a sheet board ceiling which, when it rains, runs halfway down the ceiling and then drips on the floor. We have a bath in the middle of the room to catch the rain. And this kind of extraordinary matter-of-fact account is, I suppose, very much the way in which those families who were interviewed in Bermondsey for the making of the film Housing Problem by Anstey respond to the problem. An extraordinary matter-of-fact discussion of conditions which really sound quite unbearable. The problems of kind of trying to keep children clean uh, 
in impossible conditions, the problem of trying to keep vermin away from food, and so on. And underpinning all this, the extreme difficulties with health. The, women in, the woman in question has had eight children. She's, what, something like 35. She has uh, a mastoid. She has a whole series of difficulties. What that side of the evidence reveals is the way in which the home brings together those extraordinary painful experiences. Experiences which are documented in a whole variety of ways in the great social surveys of the late 1920s, which lead to the beginning of the slum campaign, the kind of uh, surveys that Victor Post produced of the life of the unemployed, people living on bread and margarine with occasional, um, occasional treats in amongst vegetables, yes, certainly, but only the most primitive and not the most nutritious, and the woman tending to keep her own food back in order to give it to the breadwinner and her children. So there's a great deal of evidence on that account. Mass observation conducts a major survey, both of how people live and of what they want. And the disparity between the two is extreme. Even for those lucky enough to be able to take advantage of the interwar flats being built by local authorities, by the LCC, the slum clearance campaign is brought to a halt, as it were, unfinished business here, and buildings being moved into here. Even those people who move into those kind of houses would be subject to kind of housing, which by common regard is inadequate. The access balcony, the disruption to family life caused by the loss of privacy, the darkness of the kitchen, all those were resented by, even by people living in more miserable conditions and do much to give the flat a bad name. For those people moving into the council houses, the quality of what you get in the more primitive houses is extreme. You share you have the kind of facilities that will be offered to people in the 1890s. You share a scullery, you share a bathroom. The space of the home, which has a large single range of cooking on, is simply the living room and a variety of bedrooms. For the more elaborate flats, the provision of a bathroom and kitchen is combined. You have a, kit, a bath under the work surface in your kitchen. You have limited cooking facilities. The hot the mechanism for heating hot water is used both for laundry and for the bath. These are the kind of conditions that are documented on the, in the kind of papers, the assemblage of evidence of what had been. <coughs> Part of the difficulty that faces the committee, I think, and one of the ways in which one could start to make sense of that quality of portion that seems to come out in every paragraph of its writings is the discrepancy between the experience of everyday life for the vast mass of the urban working class and indeed in rural homes as well and the aspirations that people hold out for the home. If we move from the kind of evidence that the committee assembles on what people had to what they wanted. There is an extraordinary array of different things that they wanted. In the set of exhibitions, in the set of films, in the set of articles, radio talks, in the exhibition of prefabricated housing built on the Tate Gallery site to demonstrate what the temporary housing program would deliver, in these kind of images, people were offered something which corresponded, much, which was much closer to the vision held out by Reconstruction as a whole. Here was something you could believe in. At a time when the family is under extreme threat, I suppose it must be reassuring to hold out these images of a piece in which, as it were, those figures in the pre-war photograph are reinstated. And their security, their well-being, their comfort, assured. Here's a woman 
working in one of these model prefabricated houses delivered by Americans. She's got uh, what, an electric cooker. In some of these houses, she even has a refrigerator, something virtually unheard of well, before, the, before the Second World War. These photographs are actually um, French photographs, but I suppose they convey something of what could be, of what might be on offer in terms of the house. Housewife is to be made chic, she can relax, she can read magazines in her, in her kitchen. She has behind her a variety of different kinds of electrical appliances. She would have smart ironing machines, oh, sorry, a, a variety of different kinds of facilities. Yes, it's an ironing machine, a sewing machine. But what's on offer after the war, and the kind of evidence that the committee assembles on what people want, is extraordinarily exciting. If you read the kind of magazines, if you I mean, have a wet afternoon and time to spend in the library where you can find ideal home and gardening for the war years, you could read through the kind of things that are promised. There are a series of articles by architects, housing experts and others, people like Elizabeth Denby, Judith Lederberg, young fashionable architects, people like Anthony Chitty, uh, Erna Goldfinger, in which they talk about the promise of the post-war home and what was to be delivered. They talk about um, there being improved kitchen and bathroom facilities, more equipment, things like refrigerators, food mixers, and often framed in terms of the benefits coming to England after the war, which are being enjoyed by our American sisters. There's an extraordinary language of hope of what the war will deliver after the event. Homes and gardens, for example, have a series of articles on the electric kitchen, gas in the home. And this idea of an electric kettle being a luxury is, I suppose, something that's important to get across in terms of the government talking about the way in which it's going to deliver its pledge to improve conditions after the war. Well, given that kind of evidence, assembled by the committee, can we make more sense of this curiously anodyne document as in some way being representative of the government's commitment? The sense of urgency of what would come after the war, of the way in which the housing problem would dominate people's expectations of the peace is very real and very vivid. People understand, government understands, that it has to deliver. And I suppose one could read the document in a variety of ways. One could read it as a timid response by some of the less exciting ministers in the coalition government. One could read it as a timid response written by a department which had never been very glamorous, the Ministry of Health, collaborating with a new department, the Ministry of Works, which had been brought into being during the war itself and didn't have the kind of authority to write in the way that the Treasury, whatever else, might, and the other departments of state might write about. But I suppose another way to read the document <coughs> is to think of it as being quite a judicious compromise between, on the one hand, the possibility of what you might deliver, and on the other hand, the range of expectations that people held out. And I suppose if one pursued that line of reading a bit more, one could make more sense of the way in which people saw the document delivering the kind of homes that people might have after the war. And you could understand the way in which contemporary reaction to a document which, to our current reading of it, might seem extraordinarily anodyne. One could make more sense of the way in which contemporary reaction was more excited. And if one looks at buildings like the temporary bungalows poured off the conveyor lines, sorry, and looked at the way in which it was fitted out, if you looked at what was on offer in the kitchen, this electric cooker, full electric kitchen with a refrigerator, I suppose one could see that what was being promised by the document 
is actually a much more fundamental, much more fundamental improvement of conditions than people believed it was on offer simply from reading the document straight. That in relative terms, what the document was proposing was a real improvement in housing. If one goes back to the general experience of families before the war, the promise to provide an all-electric kitchen, the promise to rebuild the quality of family life, to reinstate the two parents and ch children with this kind of a home, was a real undertaking, couched in measured terms. At least government felt it had some hope of delivering an answer to the expectations that people had of rebuilding the home and the family after the war. Thanks. quite interesting is, is reading the documents, how purged they are of any reference to gender. No, I'm aware that the documents were just Right, and in, I mean the, the framework of contemporary discussion is curiously genderless. Um, the men are, as it were, I mean in terms of the, if you look at, so if I think back to the kind of evidence which is assembled by the committee, people like Marjorie Spring Rice and others, men are people who appear as it were, uh, in the evening to be fed, before they go out to the pub, they come back again, they go to bed, they have to go out to, to work in, at the beginning of the day. Men are kind of almost incidental, and the home is very much as it were, the, the center of the woman's world. The terms in which the, the documents talk, insofar as they represent gender, seem to represent it in those terms, but there's very little reflection of it. Yeah, I mean, it's really the reason I think it's about say something about the concurrent um, tendency, well, as a part of the government to virtually demonize the idea of a single mother again. I mean, it's a kind of recurrent. Right. I suppose that the, the idea of the, the family unit being fragmented is a source of anxiety then too. People are troubled at the prospect of families without fathers or fam families without mothers. But essentially, there's a feeling that those kind of wounds to the family are wounds that have been acquired honorably in the process of war, so that the collective has a duty to support them, rather than their being in any way held up for, a, for an appropriate. Where anxiety does focus, and there is real anxiety about the impact of the war on how people will behave afterwards, is the worry that there were large numbers of children who were not claimed after the evacuation process was <laughs> over, that they were simply left in those Welsh villages while their parents lived um, VE day lives in London. On investigation, that's found not to be there. But the sense in which family life had broken down is often attached to people before they get married, as it were, the nurse, the Spitfire pilot, or whatever, and have a fling. Family life is held up very much being something that has to be preserved and there are one or two people who don't make it but they deserve our sympathy. 